Um, if you've been here before, if you just kind of give me a couple minutes to explain to maybe those who might be new what we are doing here. Um, this started uh, with some research and some interviews that our newsroom partners uh, did with those uh, members of their community who self-identify as conservatives. Um, and so from what we learned from that research and those conversations, we are launching what we are calling a road to pluralism. And the idea here is that we are trying to recognize who's producing the news um, and what we as journalists and as humans have in common with our audiences and what we don't and how that reflects in our news coverage in the story selection, how we cover stories, all of that. And so our goal with the road to pluralism is really it's not to make it so that we are catering to one side or the other, or we are compromising our ethics or we're compromising accuracy, anything like that. Our goal is really, how can we be better? How can we be more fair? How can we um, not add to polarization? Um, how can we make our stories uh, better reflect our communities and be more understanding that right now they may not. Um, and so our first conversation was based on <clears throat> the use of national coverage um, from wire services and how that impacts what our audiences think of us. Also, a part of that is that we learned that people do value local news coverage. And so how can we highlight that and make sure they realize we are providing that, we're going to continue to provide that and kind of differentiate between the two. Um, last week, we talked about how generalizations and um, in our news coverage can, are they helping to add to polarizations in our communities? So are we overgeneralizing and labeling and lumping people into groups without maybe having the data to support that? <clears throat> and what language are we using in those headlines? Um, to learn more about road to pluralism and kind of everything we're doing, I will put a link in here. If you wanna kind of get more information on it to click through pull there, uh, that would be something that would be helpful just to get a better understanding if you haven't joined us already. So. That brings us to today's topic, which again is um, the third topic, where we are going to be talking about what fairness in news stories actually look like. And where, where and how this started is from the research that we did with conservatives, but also something that we've heard from news consumers over and over again. News consumers often say they want stories that just give me the facts. They just want the facts, right? Um, they want you to <clears throat> include both sides. And often what, how that comes up is they use words like balance. They use words like fairness. They want news to be balanced. They want news coverage to be fair. Um, but those are tricky concepts because when you think of both sides, well, there aren't just two sides. There usually are more than two sides. And so what we want to kind of talk about is, you know, how can we be fair in our coverage. Um, what does fairness look like day to day in coverage of social issues, politics, life in general? What makes a story feel fair? What makes a story feel neutral? What makes a story feel balanced? Um, what makes it feel opinionated or slanted? Um, and then how do those elements kind of play out in the decisions we are making day to day about things like sourcing, word choice, and headline writing? Um, you know, for most journalists, we would say that we do aim to be fair. We try to be balanced. This is something that is part of our goals. We are trying to do this on a regular basis, but for whatever reason, news consumers are not always recognizing these ideals. So how, and actually not only are they not recognizing it, but they often assume the opposite, that we are actively suppressing perspectives or highlighting others based on a personal agenda or an organizational agenda. So how can we avoid that? How can we work to be fair? And when we're working to be fair, make sure that others are also seeing that we're working to be fair. So <clears throat> I'm very grateful to have three journalists with us who participated in the interview, uh, in the interviews with our research um, earlier this year. And so I'm going to introduce both of them. Um, and then I'm going to have each of them talk for about five minutes about how they have seen this issue of fairness um, pop up in their own coverage and in the interviews. Um, and so I'm going to introduce you briefly, but um, if you could also just say a little bit when it's your time to talk more about what your role is in the newsroom, because I think that might be helpful. So we have Madeline with the Jefferson City News Tribune. We have Sarah with the Times Citizens, and we have Scott with WITF. And 
I'm just going to go with the order that is on my screen. And Sarah, you happen to be first. Um, so let's hear from you. How do you see this issue show up in your own work or in feedback from news consumers? Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, like Lynn said, I'm Sarah Conrad Baranowski. I am editor at the Iowa Falls Times Citizen. Um, we're in a very small town, 5,000 people. We cover our county, which is about 17,000 people um, in rural North Central Iowa. And um, I, I was reflecting on the interviews that I had done as part of this project in preparation for coming here and, and talking in this conversation today. And there were things that stood out that I have remembered since I did the interviews. And there are things that kind of faded into the background. So it was a really good review for me. Um, but I was kind of struck by a couple of my interviews when I asked people about um, fairness and coverage or where had they seen bias. And they mentioned things that I had never, I never would have considered that those issues or the way that we reported them were seen as unfair. Um, one was uh, that we had printed some prom photos and we chose a photo for the front page to go with a story about prom. And it was of two girls who had gone to the promenade where you walk in and parents take pictures. Two girls who, who didn't go with dates, they just went as friends with each other so that they could dress up. And we had interviewed one of them because she helped plan prom and we put it on the front page. And this person I interviewed thought that it was making fun of the community and making fun of the school because it was two girls who didn't have dates and who looked like they were going together. That had never entered my mind as something that would be seen as unfair. And so it just, it kind of opened up this, <laughs> this exploration for me of our reporting. There were a couple of other instances. And in, in one case I had used, someone had referenced uh, cancel culture in a, a meeting and I had put it in quotation marks because it's kind of a thing right now. And one of the people I interviewed saw that as I was um, commenting on what cancel culture is in a negative way, which I hadn't intended. And so really this doing these interviews made me evaluate almost everything that I do, the way that I report, the way that I write, my word choice, um, the photos that we choose. Uh, and really it's made me kind of uh, when I'm writing a story, I'm much more critical when I go back and read the story. And I should say, I write and I also edit as editor of our very small newspaper. And so I'm looking at all of my writing and I try, actually, I'm like, I know a couple of the people I interviewed and I try to keep them in mind while I'm reading these stories, like how would they perceive this? Um, and I, I've, I've spoken with our staff and really we're trying to you know, think about how might this be perceived by the community? Are we thinking about um, the lived experiences of people who are not like us and how they might see this or how they might see it as a commentary on, on their beliefs or um, their political positions? So that's been very eye-opening for me and something that stuck with me now for months since we did those interviews. Um, I also, I, I'm not sure if this is true for other participants, but our county is um, very Republican. All of our elected officials here are Republican um, from our local representatives, our state representatives, our federal representatives from, for this county are all Republican. So for us, when we write a story about government and maybe we have found that they're not doing something that they should have been doing and it's critical in any way, it can be perceived as we are picking on Republicans or conservatives. And so it's, we're having to, not having to, but explaining our processes and how we come up with stories has become much more a part of our planning process. And I've written columns about it um, because some of these interviews kind of illuminated the, the fact that people don't understand where we come up with story ideas. They, in one interview, the woman I talked to said, well, you know, I don't know if it trickles down from the higher ups who own the newspaper, or maybe you're taking guidance from the CDC on how you should be reporting and didn't quite understand how we found sources or how we um, decided what to report. So, I mean, it's really, it's made me much more aware of how 
or a job, we've done of explaining how we do our job, um, which is a little bit depressing <laughs> and maybe embarrassing, but also illuminating. And I think it's helping us um, kind of come up with how we move forward and how we do a better job of connecting with those people. I don't want to monopolize the time here. No, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm really glad. I, I love that you said like other, the community's lived experiences. And I think that's really what we are trying to do here with A Road to Pluralism is, you know, this started out with, with these interviews with conservatives, but this applies to so many more people in our community who they're, we're all a little bit different based on things that we've experienced, things we've been through. We have different beliefs. We've lived differently and we've been brought up differently, all of that. And that contributes to how we perceive what is happening around us, even down to word choice, right? It's going to, people might react differently to different words or adjectives used to describe things based on something they've experienced. And again, beyond just conservatives and in political stuff, um, it could be um, the, the way you were raised, where you come from rural versus urban, your age, you know, all of these different things. And so that's why that lived experience and trying to understand that is a big part of this um, road to pluralism, what we're trying to help journalists think about and understand. So thank you, Sarah, for sharing that. And Madeline, I'm going to go to you next. Thank you so much for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, Madeline LaRue. I'm the community engagement editor at uh, the Jefferson City News Tribune, which is located in the capital city of Missouri. So um, we are a fairly conservative area. Um, my position is kind of a unique. It's a newer position. I don't think it's even two years old in our newsroom, um, but it is specifically to focus on these types of issues and increase the accountability and transparency between our publication and the public that we serve, the community that we serve. Um, I can't agree with Sarah enough in what I found from my interviews. It really um, kind of cemented something that I'd suspected for a while, which is that we, especially in newspapers, I think, take uh, take for granted. We think that the public assume, understands how we do things and why we do things, when in reality, it's an unfair assumption that we're making. Um, they don't understand it. Uh, one of the things that really stood out was uh, one interview I did where he, uh, the uh, person referenced a very local story on a local Teamster strike and how he assumed that the reporter was advancing an agenda and siding with the Teamsters because we had more information from the Teamsters. Uh, they were willing to talk to us and management didn't give us more than one sentence statement to put in the story. The reader assumed that we had cut everything from management except for that one sentence. We didn't take the extra step to explain that that's all we got. Uh, because again, we had that assumption that the reader would know that, which is just, it's something that I found broadcast does a little bit better than newspapers at kind of taking that extra step and explaining their processes. I think we've been very much conditioned in newspapers to make sure that we are not a part of the story and definitely not the focus of the story. So taking that extra step to explain our processes, I think for a lot of us, makes us feel like, are we making this about us and how we put the story together? Cause that feels wrong. Um, so a lot of it is a mindset that I think we have to change internally and to be able to be open and have these conversations was a really big step in the right direction. And I'm just gonna stop it there for now before I go off even further. <laughs> no, th thank you so much. And I was just getting ready to put in the chat something that um, you know, when I first joined Trusting News, I don't know that I really thought this way, but I've come to think this way that, you know, what we're really thinking about is we're trying to do journalism a little bit differently um, and to think about it a little bit differently. That doesn't mean we're compromising, you know, the standard or anything, but that we are willing to use feedback from the community to think, how can we be better? Are there things we should be doing better? And are we willing to explain how the process works, which is something that you saw a little bit in the past, but there wasn't a ton of that. And we kind of just assumed people know how it works, but why would they know how it works? They, they haven't been journalists, just like, I don't know how a plumber necessarily does their job, right? And so we need to do, we need to take the due diligence to make those explanations because otherwise people don't know and they're making assumptions and those tend to be negative. So this is kind of thinking about doing journalism a little bit differently um, in, in the process and the how we do it and what that looks like to put a story together might change a little bit um, as we do this. 
So next, let's hear from Scott. A lot of people think they know how to do our job, right? <laughs> That's partly why we're here, I think. Um, but I think, uh, Lynn, you, you framed, you know, for, from my end, um, so I, I'm, I'm an editor at WITF, um, public media station in Harrisburg. We are also in a predominantly co uh, conservative Republican area. We, uh, we cover about 19 counties in central PA. And um, um, I, work, I work closely, I'm, I'm the senior editor in the newsroom. I work closely with the news director uh, with all of our, our local content and, and stories and, and such as that. So, um, so, but we face the same challenges that, um, uh, that Sarah and Madeline are talking about in terms of where we're situated and who a lot of our um, audience and, and community is. I think, um, Lynn, you, you, you phrased a question to us as kind of like, what, what are the challenges of, what's the fairness challenge essentially, um, and how does it manifest? And I mean, just a couple of ways, you know, for me and for us is that, um, it, it, for me, it's, it's kind of like what you just laid out, which is how you, um, as journalists and news organizations, uh, adapt to or assimilate or, or understand um, how people are perceiving your coverage and what they're saying they want to see in your coverage while not lowering your journalistic standards and ethics um, in a way that compromises what you're doing, compromise the, compromises the integrity of what you're doing. Um, and so the, just a couple things for, like examples from, from our end, um, you know, in, I think when we have conversations, sometimes it comes down to, uh, with, with people who are objecting to what we're covering, sometimes it comes down to whose facts you're talking about, right? It's so easy for people to find their echo chamber online. So when they experience independent journalism, they feel like there's something wrong. Um, they feel like they've been wronged if they don't uh, see something that reflects their bias and what they're bringing to the conversation. And, and so that that puts, uh, I think, us in a position of, you know, we need to think about and check ourselves and really think hard about are we are we as independent as we say we are? You know, are we are we actually in that space um, or are we doing things intentionally or unintentionally that um, that that are pushing us to one side or another? Um, like the it's like the example that. Uh, Sarah had about you know the the prom photo I mean you would just there was nothing behind that you know but all of a sudden you're in a position of kind of reassessing well what how you know how did that play out that way or whatever for us just a couple of examples we actually got criticized on Twitter for doing this re-engage the right effort so uh, uh, a Democrat a left-wing liberal person self-avowed liberal you know self-described criticized us for talking to conservative Republicans. These people are the devil. Why would you talk to them? Why do you care what they think? You know, why, why would you single them out as being more important than anybody else? You know, so we, we, got, we got that from, from that side. And then we've got a guy who emails us, me pr primarily, literally every day, <laughs> literally every day with his commentary on whatever he heard on Morning Edition. <laughs> There's a question about why he keeps listening if he's this pissed off about it but anyway he does and he emails and his most recent one said that if we do not have people in our state at our station who express his concerns in our in our news gathering then we are simply an echo chamber for the left and to give you an example of where he's coming from his he 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 added to that that we should be asking whether the Biden administration wants to spend U.S. taxpayer money to put up a statue to Osama bin Laden to replace the Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond that just came down. Now, how you would get from, how you would make those connections, I think, is a mystery, but he's making some kind of connection there. I think Biden, or somebody, the Secretary of State made some nice comment about Pakistan allowing the U.S. to go in and get bid on or something. I don't know. It was very strange. But th those are the kind of like the, the fringes, you know, that, that we deal with and that put us in that position of sort of checking ourselves and making us have these conversations, which we should have, but they are challenging. That's, that's why I bring it up. The other one is 
just quickly is that, you know, I think framing and focusing stories is part of our jobs as journalists. Um, you know, we, we all know we're not stenographers and we're not PR people. And facts and context are also part of our job, but any of those things can be seen as bias or can actually be bias um, if, if you allow them to be or if you're not, not careful. Um, and, and so in, in Lynn, I think your initial question, you know, talked about what does fairness look like or sound like or whatever. I mean, a couple of, so a couple of things that we, I think, are trying to be careful about are, you know, tone and word usage, right? Um, we had a, a host and a reporter do a, a two-way, an interview to be aired about the uh, Pennsylvania election investigation that, that the Republicans are doing here, modeled after the the Arizona one. And um, there was this big political kerfluffle about the one legislator who was leading it. Basically, the, the, the GOP Senate leader knocked him aside and put another guy in charge of it. And it was all this internal politics and everything. And so part of the two-way was about that. And, and, um, and, and the reporter said, just describe that. And he said, you know, but don't be fooled. These are these these guys are on the same team. You know, they all want the same thing. And <laughs> my thought was, why are we saying don't be fooled? That that's like treating it as though they're trying to skulk around and do something secretly or do something other than what they said they were going to do. They're doing exactly what they said they were going to do. It's just a fact. Just say they're on the same team. You know, it's just a fact. They are. They are after the same thing. So just say it as a fact. And then in 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 the digital version, that's one one thing. But when when you hear it with your voice and the inflection, you know that's another thing we have to watch out for in radio. Um, I was I was listening to a draft of a of a uh, another story that talked about whether uh, that talked about Trump trying to take credit for something that was going on, and and the host said, "Well, did it did it work? You know, did this area you know vote for Trump or whatever?" And the the reporter said, "Yeah, it kind of did." You know, like as though the reporter was personally disappointed that that had happened. <laughs> it's like, just say it. Just say, you know, yes, it appears that, you know, this may have had an effect. You know, just report it. Just report it out. So I think it's important for us, and this is where I can sort of come around on, on the, the challenge, is to have, you know, have and maintain, like actively upkeep your radar for these kinds of things. And there'll, there'll always be things that hit you that you can't, that are in your blind spot, like the prompt. It's <laughs> a perfect example, but um, but and I think talking regularly with people will help that. Um, um, and I think that's what we got uh, out of the reengage the right thing is that we we were talking to people and we want to go back to them and we want to keep talking about that and sort of keep that uh, keep that muscle working, you know, so we can develop it more. So anyway, sorry I talked a long time, but those are the challenges that that I think we we are tackling, or some of them that I think we're tackling. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you so much, Scott. And I'm really glad you focused on word choice because that is something that came out of um, not only this research, but that we've heard from all sorts of news consumers. And, you know, we think of word choice, you know, headlines, what's in headlines, what's in social, what are we choosing to put in a headline and how are we framing a headline, right? Um, that all can come down to how fair someone might think a story is. Um, are we making it about what an individual did? And then does it seem in it like an attack against that person? Or are we making it more about what happened, what the outcome is, right? Um, <clears throat> word choice also and consistency of word choice or adjectives. So an example that one of our newsroom, uh, what that we've heard from newsroom partners is when you're talking about politicians, how often are you adding which party they are associated with? Are you doing it all the time? What is your policy with that? Is it consistent? If someone reads one story and it's about a Republican and you constantly say, Republican so-and-so, Republican so-and-so, or so-and-so who's running as a Republican, but then there's a story about someone who's a Democrat and it's mentioned once, you could see how the lack of consistency might lead someone to think that they're, that you're not being fair, that there isn't balance in that coverage. Um, <clears throat> something else I do want to mention that we find that's part of this issue of fairness um, that we want to talk about and then I'm going to open it up to other people who are here. Um, so if you do be thinking, if you have ways that this has shown up in your own newsroom, because we'd like to hear from you. Um, but the idea of corrections. So 
this may seem so basic, but this is something that is, is really frustrating to me personally. Um, I think one, we as journalists, we don't like to make mistakes, right? We try really, really hard not to, but unfortunately they do happen. So then the question is, do we have a corrections policy? I bet most of you probably would say, yes, my newsroom has a corrections policy. The next question though is, is that policy written down? That may not get as many yeses, right? Then the next question is, okay, are we consistent with that correction policy? And I know having worked in newsrooms, we try to be, um, but I know there were definitely times where you'd kind of be in the newsroom and you'd say, well, ask so-and-so because last time this happened 10 years ago, they were here, let's see what we did. And it's like, well, it's not super reliable <laughs> um, in a newsroom to if we wanna be held accountable with consistency. And specifically with corrections, readers, users, they, <clears throat> they realize that. And then kind of that next step is when you ask newsrooms whose corrections policies are publicly available and can be easily found, um, the answer and the number gets even smaller. And so that's something that came out of this research and that we do hear from other news consumers is just when we make a mistake, are we willing to say it? Are we willing to admit it? And how clear are we being about that? And when do we do it? And so that's also something that I think falls into this that we're hoping maybe there are some newsrooms that want to work on this and see what, what we can do to be better about that. Um, so I did want to mention just those two other things. Um, and so now, does anyone um, here besides Sarah, Madeline, and Scott want to talk about how they've seen this idea of fairness or accusations of lack of fairness um, pop up in your newsroom or in your own work? Or feel free to comment also on anything that you've heard Sarah, Madeline, Scott, or myself say. Can I jump in with something, Lynn? Yes, absolutely. Hi, for the, the few of you I don't know, I'm Joy Mayer, I'm the director of Trusting News. I'm kind of making a list here of what could be on this radar. I love the idea of a radar that we're keeping, right? And so I'm wondering what it looks like. There are so many variables and stories. And so at, what we're working on at Trusting News is trying to figure out what do strategies to address this look like? Concretely, what can we do? So things like, when do you list somebody's political party? <laughs> like how, what would that what would that radar look like that would say um that would that would get journalists to pause and ask that question when do you put something like cancel culture in quotes when have you explained um to madeline's point like how why your look across the different sides of an issue and um how hard you worked or your access to different information i just wanted to throw out there that we are really interested in your thoughts on what would be on that radar that checklist and um, and I'm completely aware that it's complex and that stories aren't all created equal. There's no easy answer. What we're trying to do is think what questions should journalists be pausing and asking. Thanks, Joy. We had um, <clears throat> Ali, um, I don't know if, if you'd want to unmute and talk more about what you're trying to do with corrections, but um, we'd love to hear from you if, if you're in a position to do that. But I think that whole idea, again, of you know, newsroom knowledge, how many things that we do are our newsroom knowledge and can we actually get these things written down and are we willing to be transparent and make them public and be held accountable for what we say that we are doing? I don't see Ali unmuting or raising a hand. So I will go to Lisa or Ali, there you are. Would you like to say a little more about that? So you're still muted. I don't know if you'd want to say a little more about that. If not, that's okay too. Oh, shaky internet. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think I'm, I'm popping in and out here. So if I freeze, that's the reason why. Um, yeah, just following up on that comment, we've had a lot of new faces join our newsroom in the past year, one of them being me. Um, and because of that, a lot of the knowledge holders who just, you know, do these things based on how they've been doing it for years are gone from the newsroom and we're facing these instances where something comes up or we're trying to answer an audience or a reader comment. And we're having to ask a bunch of people. And I feel like that system of, of not knowing, not having that written down on a public facing is, is becoming somewhat apparent. Thanks. 
Thank, thank you for sharing that. And I think that, again, what that can look like to uh, the news consumer is a lack of consistency, right? And when things aren't consistent, then they may see it as bias or as being unfair toward maybe something they believe or uh, an issue they care about. Um, so I'm glad that you're working on that. And again, we're here as a resource to help with that. And maybe there are a bunch of newsrooms that want to work on that <clears throat> together to try to get policies like that public. Um, I think that would be really helpful. Uh, Lisa, I saw your hand up. I don't know if you'd want to um, to share some thoughts. Yeah, a couple of things. I um, On the corrections policy, I think um, I would agree and hope most newsrooms have a policy um, I would think it's written down the same way many news organizations would have ethics statements that are written down because accuracy and uh, should really be part of kind of mission um, kind of statements. Um, I just checked while we were looking because I actually wasn't sure in terms of the accessibility, but on our website where we list staff and um, newsroom contacts, that sort of thing, thankfully we do have um, our corrections policy. So it says something like if you have a concern about accuracy, those sorts of things to contact um, and we list the name of our publisher and our top newsroom editor with their emails and phone numbers. So that's easily accessible. I think that more often what comes up um, for us is where corrections run. We tend to run ours on 2A, which is where we have weather and some other um, sort of lottery, those sorts of things um, as a consistent place. There are sometimes exceptions where if something is um, usually sports section, we'll run corrections in the sports section with the thought that many readers, you know, if sports is really their, um, you know, content interest may not see something on 2A. Um, we have one corrections on 1A if the story has been on 1A and if it has been such a significant story or such an egregious error. Um, and so we do have those variables. Um, I suppose if we were trying to be the most transparent we could add that to our website in terms of where and why, um, a little bit of the why. Um, on the political parties issue, um, we'd, I'm pretty sure we have that not written down. Um, we tend to use it when there are votes along party lines because it would make sense if, and reporters covering those stories should be aware of that um, if they're doing their job as, as a beat or even a fill-in reporter and in election races. On a typical story, if it's a mixed party um, vote, you know, or a unanimous vote and we're writing city council approved funding for three local parks, there really is no need to um, say what the political party is. And so that's kind of our approach. Um, I don't really know that that would be helpful in terms of having that written where the public can see it. Um, as transparent as we want to be, sometimes there are nuances. And so if you have something written down, then you risk people waving the finger, you said, or your statement says, but I guess the best way to counteract that has already been alluded to in terms of the context and explaining to people what we do, why we do. For example, with crime stories, if we vary from what we normally do, like naming a minor, we typically explain why. So thank you. And I'm sorry, I, I, um, managing editor <laughs> at the Journal Gazette. It's a print newspaper in Northeast Indiana, Fort Wayne specifically. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Lisa. And I think you are right with policies. I think sometimes where journalists get kind of, I guess, hesitant to maybe talk or make some of this public is that there is a lot of nuance. And if we're honest, we don't always follow everything to a T because of different circumstances or it's a different situation. And I think it's fair because we're always trying to be as fair as possible. And that's why it's not always exactly the same. And that's why it might not always be exactly the same standard. And so Something, um, you know, as we're talking about making these policies public, maybe it's not actually taking that internal policy and like copy and pasting and making it public. It might be a version of it where you use terms like 
usually, normally, um, our best practice is to. So it's not this like always, we definitely always kind of do it that way. So that's something we've worked with newsrooms to do and I think can be helpful, but you are right. There is some hesitancy and for, for good reason because we do sometimes make changes. And that's and the, the funny thing about that though is that we make those changes because we're trying to be fair, right? And then we get accused of <clears throat> not being fair in the process. Um, I wanted to share something and Scott, um, I know we haven't had a chance to talk about this note, but I was going to share the note that just went up at the top of that critical race uh, theory story that you did. Um, I'm going to put it here in the link um, here. I don't know if you want to talk about um, why you decided to kind of add that note at the top of this story about critical race theory. You told us to. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, no, we, we, um, you know, our, we actually wanted to, it, it sprang from our conversation with you, me, and, and the reporter who was working on that. And, and that conversation was, was mo mostly we wanted to have that conversation because we, we just wanted to make sure that we were um, doing what we could when we called people who opposed CRT um, to, to do some of what we're talking about here, like to, to be respectful, to be open, uh, to, to not ask questions that were, you know, accusatory um, because we know there's a lot of misinformation out there and we know that people are using CRT to refer to a lot of things that are not CRT and all that kind of thing. So we just wanted to have that conversation to, to kind of get a little more grounded in how we would approach those interviews. And then we started talking about actually sort of telling people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of what our approach was. And so, um, and then, and so that's that's sort of where the idea of putting that atop the story came from. And we've done that in the past. We've, in, in fact, um, Tim Lambert, who's one of your coaches, who's our news director, is not here now, but um, he sent me uh, an example of where we had done it. I actually forgot that we did this, but with a, um, I think it was a, re a redistricting story from like last year, or we were, were doing a series of them and we would put language on the top uh, that would sort of explain where we were coming from and um, in about that many words. And so, so there was a precedent, you know, for, for us doing that. And then we have set up a page on our site that where there's an embed for people to um, give us feedback through, uh, it's a trusting news page explaining, you know, the whole concept and it has an embed. So that language sends people to that page if they want to get in touch with us. And, you know, and, and, um, and I think that was, that was a suggestion you made about just to encourage people to, to reach out. You know, it's, it's, this story isn't the last story we'll do on it. And it certainly doesn't mean that these people who are in this story are the only people that we can ever talk to about it. So um, if that helps, that's kind of where that came from. It does, it does, thank you. And I think, again, it's with, with some of these issues that are like so polarizing, the, the thought and something that I wonder and, and why I made the suggestion to WITF and I wonder if more newsrooms are willing to do this, is, is there a way to kind of take someone who might be against, let's just say they're against critical race theory or they're against what their version of critical race theory is, right? Is there a way to kind of prevent them from just instantly thinking that your story is not going to be fair because they just have this polarizing relationship with the topic by kind of saying, we know this is polarizing. We know people have strong views, but we're still working to be fair with it. And here's how we're doing that. So like, please still read. And I don't know, maybe it won't work, but that's something that I'm wondering, like, does that kind of stop people for a second to be like, you know, wait, maybe I should put those feelings aside and actually read this and, and see what this is because they are telling me they're trying to be fair. It may not work, but I know that's something I'm wondering that maybe there are more newsrooms willing to try that. And can we test that. And so as we're moving on here toward the end, I do want to kind of move in to talk about like, what are some possible solutions to this? Or what are things that we could try to try to make it, again, we as journalists, we're working to be fair. How can we make sure that our audience knows that we are working to be fair? Um, what are some things we can do to make sure that's highlighted? And so I'd like to go back to, um, to Sarah, Madeline, and Scott. And Sarah, I'll start with you. Um, first, is there anything maybe that you've already started doing? And then also, is there anything that 
you really want to try. And this could be any kind of pie in the sky idea. We kind of want to brainstorm and see what people are coming up with. Um, so I, this is a very specific example and not something necessarily that we would continue, but as a direct result of one of my conversations through these interviews, one of the criticisms from one interview subject was that we had only written about how great the COVID vaccines were and hadn't written about people who didn't want to get the vaccine. And I told her, I, you know, I've tried to find people, I haven't found any. And so I eventually talked her into being a subject, an interview subject for the story and found a couple of other people and wrote a story about it um, and talked to them and they, uh, shared why they were hesitant or just outright against getting the vaccine. And as a reporter, I felt it was really important that I also include information from a medical professional about the vaccines. And so I did. And obviously the medical professional had different opinions than um, one of the people who I talked to who was really, who said that the vaccine was dangerous. And so, I mean, that person was not, the person who was, who does not believe the vaccine is safe was not happy that I had also included comments from the doctor. Part of it is that I'm just going to have to accept that people will not like some of the reporting that I do or that our staff does. And I think Scott mentioned this, you know, if you believe that the CDC is corrupt and that they are only feeding you lies, then when I quote information from the CDC, you are not going, you're going to think my reporting is biased, but Am I compromising my reporting by not including that information? Absolutely. Um, there's a, a reader right now who would really like for me to report on how great ivermectin is and how it is a wonderful solution for COVID-19. However, all of the information that I'm receiving from local, state, and national uh, health professionals is that it is not a good treatment for COVID-19. And so, as much as this person wants me to report this, it's not responsible for me to report this. Um, so, I mean, and I didn't mean this, I mean, you tossed it to me to say, how are you going to improve it? I don't mean to say like, I'm not going to listen to these. I'm not, I'm not, I, I believe that there are things that people are telling us that are valid complaints or criticisms or, hey, you're not including this about the viewpoint. And then I think there are other things that, um, like Scott said, again, um, it would be irresponsible or it would compromise our integrity to report in the way that they would really like for us to report. But really, I think this opened up a way, a conversation for us to have with some, some people in our community and then maybe open it up wider to more people in our community to say, you know, what, what are our blind spots? Because we have many, <laughs> we're a newsroom of five people. Uh, we have many, many blind spots on not just this, this issue. So I think the first step is becoming aware that you have these blind spots. And then, you know, who do we go to? And it can't just be the same three people that we go to all the time. It's got to be a lot of different people because some of the criticism is very specific to one person. Um, I think Joy typed in the comment section that one person we interviewed said that they didn't trust any news that was produced outside of our county, which that's great for us, <laughs> but it's troubling for other news outlets. Um, and so it's just, it's going to be talking to a lot of people, evaluating the way that we're reporting. A huge piece of it is explaining our reporting. And I really like the example from Scott Station about that piece at the top. I've, um, I mean, I think we've also used other ideas from Trusting News. The Gazette in Cedar Rapids is in Cedar Rapids, Iowa is part of Trusting News and I read them a lot. And so I've gotten some ideas from their reporting about, you know, explaining who this reporter is, that she's been covering education for five years. And, you know, if you have um, an opinion or a thought or a story idea, contact her here. And so we've kind of incorporated that also. Kind of, we always just assumed like, if people have ideas, they're going to call us, but that's not necessarily true. Um, we have to open up that, uh, avenue of communication with them and maybe take the first step or five steps. Um, but I think just being aware and talking to people and asking them for honest feedback, which can be difficult. I mean, these interviews were not easy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't want to monopolize again, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. 
No, thank, thanks, Sarah. And I think, you know, your, your example or that you give there just about like asking people to contact you, asking people to get in touch or to weigh in something that we've talked about a lot, like people don't know or don't think necessarily, there are some people who do to contact a news organization, but if we're not asking, why do we just think people are going to contact us? Like, I don't know that I've ever contacted a news organization myself, right? I mean, so there are lots of other people who haven't either. So just doing that ask could be a good first step that we do to try to fill those blind spots um, and, and help us try to work to be more fair and get more perspectives from the community. Um, and, yeah. yeah, sorry, I did want to add also when I did when I did the story about people who were hesitant to get the vaccine, I kind of did a call for, hey, if you're if you're not planning on getting the vaccine and you would be willing to talk with us, a reporter about why you're hesitant. And I got an email from a conservative member of our community who called me Marxist for um, asking for people to share their vaccine hesitancy and was just, I mean, it was like a barn burner of an email um, criticizing us for uh, asking people to share this very private decision. So even that example, I was criticized because I wasn't reporting on vaccine hesitancy. And then I was criticized for asking people to talk about their vaccine hesitancy. So it just really illuminated that, I mean, what we all know, we're never going to make everyone happy. Um, but there are definitely things that we can do to um, open up and, you know, share other opinions and other viewpoints. Right. Yes. Thank you. Um, Madeline, what about in your newsroom? And we do have about 12 minutes. So I don't know if you want to take just two or three to kind of summarize things that maybe you have um, either done or things you want to try to try to make people uh, see that you are trying, that you're working to be fair. Sure. Um, so I have to say that it, the News Tribune, we're very lucky. We have had some success in processes that have already been established. Uh, we have fairly regular, um, we call them coffee with the editors that are just like, we have two hours set aside for the editor. Will the managing editor will be at this coffee shop or we've done them virtually during the pandemic and just bring your questions, bring your thoughts, bring your input, whatever, and just have a freewheeling discussion. Um, and those have been going for several years now. So, um, but the, the reality is that not everybody will go to those, not everybody has time for those, not everybody pays attention to the fact that those are even happening. Um, and so a lot of it is, you know, Joy and I have talked a lot about just kind of, you can't just put something out there once and then say we covered it and it's done. <laughs> you have to keep explaining, you have to consistently do these things. Uh, because one reader may have seen that and 80 readers may not have picked up that paper or seen that page. Um, the other thing that came out of this for me was really uh, taking that moment, that extra step when you're writing and reading and editing a story of how does this look to somebody who doesn't know our process? Um, are we taking that, that time to explain, well, uh, you know, there was a chat in the, a minute ago of, well, we reached out to six experts and they all said this, uh, or they or they didn't get back to us or, or whatever, just a way to actually take that step of explaining why or why not there's this little information and this much from one side, uh, just taking those extra steps to consistently say, tell us what we're doing, <laughs> here's, here's how we're doing our processes and tell us what you're not understanding about what we do. Uh, one of the things that we do now is we take part in a lot more events and we actually have created uh, little business cards that are how to submit a news tip or how to reach the newsroom, um, what makes a news story kind of a thing to help people realize like, hey, you can call us, here's how to get in touch with us. Um, and those things have been really helpful and we just try to like hand them out at every opportunity. That sounds very cool. Um, I don't know if we have that in the example, but if you could send us like a picture of what that looks like, we'd love to, to see that to, to share with the group. Thanks. Um, Scott, again, just a couple minutes, things that maybe you have done or maybe you want to try to do more of to get at this issue of perceived fairness. Sure, I think uh, one of the things Tim and I talked about after we did the interviews with uh, in the re-engage the right thing, we, we had a couple of uh, people that we talked to say that they would be willing to, um, to, to help be a convener of other uh, Republican, conservative Republicans um, to talk more, just to establish, sort of establish a dialogue or an ongoing thing, kind of a little bit like maybe what Madeline was talking about. So we want to do that. Um, 
we it's we haven't just gotten to it. Tim's been off on a project um, and he's back soon. But so we'll I think we're gonna we're gonna talk more about that. By the way, if you haven't listened to Sacred Ground on the pod the podcast, look it up. I'll just plug Tim's thing. It's about Flight 93. It's a really personal story. Um, so sorry for the, the shameless plug. Um, I, I really wish that we, uh, beyond that, I wish that we could get in front of, um, uh, I don't know what, what like non-conspiracy theorist uh, <laughs> political people, um, and mainly those might be Republican groups and in our area, um, in their setting, you know, if they have a, a a monthly meeting or something like that, you know, could like Tim and I go there and have a conversation about journalism and how we do what we do and where they're coming from and what they see in us and just continue that conversation in that kind of a venue. Um, I feel like that could be a step toward uh, some more mutual understanding. It could help us uh, sharpen that, that radar that we've been talking about and, and could help them understand what we do. And then, um, I, I, I'm as guilty of this as anybody. I try not to be, but I, I wish that news organizations and journalists could, could just aggressively move away from labeling uh, people and things and groups and organizations. I think it, it, it hurts us and, and hurts our coverage generally when we get lean too much on that. And then my biggest wish is that I really, really wish that we could get a group of people who, who right now have in their news diet, um, you know, and Newsmax and you know all the right wing uh, uh, news organizations, and get them to read and listen to only us <laughs> for a month, and then come back and let's have a conversation about where they are in terms of how they perceive the news and what's going on and what's independent journalism and what's biased journalism and everything else. I just want part of me just wonders how or if that would change the conversation that we're all talking about here. Um, and that might never happen, but you said wish list. So yes. that's it. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. That's one of those that I don't know that's intriguing to me. I would love to see what what would happen in that in that situation um, if we had people that were willing and, and we could kind of track it. Um, so we're, we have like seven minutes left. I've Two people with their hands up, Margo and Allison. I'm wondering if you could each take like a minute because then I want to give a couple minutes to kind of talk about what our next steps are with this and how you can get involved. So Margo, go ahead. Yeah, I actually just put mine in the chat um, and Allie kind of answered it a little bit. Um, the whole thing about using social media or Facebook in particular to um, source stories and um, you know vet ideas Anytime that we have put anything out on Facebook, especially if we go outside of our own Facebook page and go to other pages and say, hey, you know, um, all we get is crackpots and delivery complaints. And so I'm wondering, you know, how do you get, how do you get to where you can be confident that your social media platform is going to be helpful? Um, and I don't expect an answer right now, but if anyone wants to put something in the chat, you can keep moving. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, thank you. We're writing it down. I think that's something that if we could find ways to test or experiment to make that better or see if there are ways to make it better, I think that would be great to have some, if we had some newsrooms willing to, to test out some ideas and just see if it works, that would be great. Um, th thanks, Margo. Allison. So I can go real fast. Um, I, I just wanted to recommend an essay. I'll put it in the chat called Complicating the Narrative. Um, and it, it's the, the author went to like, you know, rabbis and mediators and people who are not journalists. And, and it's a way of like using some of their techniques. A lot of you are nodding. So I'm sure a lot of people have heard it, but the Solutions Journalism Network did some training with our newsroom that I thought was really invaluable and I recommend it. So I'll stick it in the chat. That's great. Th thank you so much. So so one, thank all of you for weighing in. Like I said, this is the third of five conversations we're having. We have two more coming up, which I'm going to have Joy talk about in just one moment. But before I do that, I want to say if you haven't already and you are at all interested in kind of helping brainstorm solutions to this and things we might be able to try or that we might test to see if they work to help with bias, to help with fairness, um, to help with this whole idea of national coverage versus local coverage. Um, please apply for our pluralism network. Basically what happens is 
um, you apply and uh, then we invite you on to Slack and then we're going to basically come up with experiments there. And the idea is we'll get groups of newsrooms to try things together, maybe be able to tie it to research, get some data, all of that. Um, and so Joy, I'm going to toss it to you to uh, talk about what comes next. Awesome. And I see Rod actually had a hand up too there. So I'm going to just pause and see. Hey, Rod, how's it going? Uh, doing fine. I'm guessing that you're, we, we need to move on. So that's okay. I guess I can try to join in another time. No, I think we, we have them. No, we have take a minute. It's all right. Yes. Take a yes. minute. Well, Go ahead. Well, again, we were talking about wish lists, wish lists. And I'm thinking, again, actually being out in the community in places that aren't, you know, maybe around your organizations, whether it's a paper or if it's the NPR place. So you don't just show up when things are bad or things are controversial. If they don't actually see you there and addressing them in many different contexts, if you just drop in and all of a sudden you're somehow the authority and then you run away and leave, then they're not necessarily going to engage with you. And you actually have to have a presence and a conscious presence in as many different places as possible so that you don't just show up only as the enemy. And that's that's kind of a thing to kind of put in your head. Awesome. You're absolutely right. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we, as Lynn mentioned, this is week three of our sort of five week rollout of themes we're focusing on with this new Road to Pluralism initiative. Um, I am excited and also kind of nervous about next week's theme. It's when we're going to talk about bias in the newsroom and who we are as journalists and how our own blind spots and experiences affect um, how affect our work and affect how what we think is important, how who we talk to every day um, and sort of our universes can actually be in complete parallel to next door universes that um, that think our world is super weird and uh, we lack even a window into their world too often. I've gotten the sense lately that, um, so let me just say that this is, this today's topic especially focused quite a bit on political differences because the, the accusations of, of like fairness and balance often relate to how where people fall on a political spectrum. But our pluralism work in general is really about just all the different ways we see the world and how journalism reflects, authentically reflects the lives of and um, respects those differences. You know, the, the sort of the definition of pluralism is around, uh, you know, there being different ways to see the world and how it how it it takes those those different ways are valid and it and it takes all of us to do this experiment called democracy. So next week we're gonna. I've I've just I've gotten the sense lately that, um, and and have through the work with these partner newsrooms that there are a lot of journalists whose whose worlds look a whole lot just like them, um, and. Um, I am excited to talk about what the purpose of, um, what it means to have intellectual diversity, diversity of thought in a newsroom, what it looks like to have a room full of people who challenge each other to see the world differently. We do that all the time, supernaturally in some ways, and in other ways, we just don't really talk about it very much. So that's what we're going to talk about next week, including, um, potential solutions for that and what it would look like for newsrooms to have more honest conversations about their own blind spots. So um, join us at this same time next week if you can, and I'll be writing about this between now and then. Um, and if, you, if there were any ideas you wanted to share that and didn't get to today, I'll hang out here for a minute and also um, make sure that our email address is in the chat. Thank you so much for coming. Yes, thanks everyone. And thanks Kim for telling me uh, what a beat sweetener is. I was not familiar with that term, so now I learned that. So thank you so much. <laughs> cool. Um, Joy, I think.